let's just worship. I know we're packed in here and it's all the rest of them. We're here. I don't know what we're doing. We go in the kitchen and the overflow room. Just, that's a good problem to have. Yeah. But I just want us to focus on one thing. Jesus. All I could hear this week at prayer when we come for prayer here was just Jesus. Just Jesus. You know, Jesus said, you know, if you see me, you see the Father. Everybody's like, well, I don't want to leave the Father out. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. So I just want us to focus on him and what does he want. I heard a quote by Michael Koulianis, who's a preacher in Florida that I enjoyed listening to. Jesus' image is his ministry, in case you want to check it out. But he said something about the fact that you only begin to truly worship Jesus when you forget about you. When you totally lose yourself and you're not thinking about, oh, God heal my back, or God, when you lose sight of yourself and it's all Him, that's when you're truly worshiping. So I encourage you today, let's do that. Let's just truly, truly worship. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs>
nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. If you're already saved and you need to repent of things, do it right where you are. Do it right now. Take care of it. When you do, it's wrong. Just receive his forgiveness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sing number 150 in the book. Rest on us. Oh, yes, yes. Just give yourself over to worship this morning. You'll find that one of the most freeing and beautiful things is oh, just yeah. surrender yes. unto worship. Just worship Him this morning.
says are demonic so many times and I saw like a writhing snake that just wants to keep just going through not only here but among God's people worldwide to try to debilitate them we're not having that we have authority over that so you just receive total healing right now name of Yeshua right now. Just even if you have to just put your hands up and just receive total healing. Total healing. Which is yours by the blood of Jesus. Which is yours. Which is your covenant. Which is your heritage. We don't have to play around with devils. You have the authority, not just me. You have the authority to say, Go. And you call it by name. If there's a sickness in your house, you call it by name. And you call it by that demonic thing that it is. And you say, get out of my house. Take authority in the name of Jesus. It's time for God's people to stand up and take that authority. We've accepted too much. The church of God has accepted too much. Well, it'll run its course. This is just what happens. Don't you accept it. Don't you receive it. Never 
wants you to know, like she said, your authority. I think sometimes we, we give in to thinking that we're this thing up against this big, big force. But the littlest bit of light in you is stronger than the darkest dark in all of hell. That's right. And so that light that is in you is greater than anything you're going to come up against. And here's the thing. You, if you're a born-again Christian, you have that light inside of you. And so that light that's inside of us, it is more powerful than any darkness that could try to come against you. That's right. And where there is light, there cannot be light and dark in the same space. And here's the thing. Dark can't fight back against the light. When you shine a flashlight, it's not like... Even scientifically, there's a battle to see, well, maybe the flashlight won't shine bright this time, but next time it might. No, when the light shines, darkness vanishes. And so you walk in that faith and you walk in that confidence, whether it be sickness, fear, whatever it may be. That light in you is greater than any darkness. Any darkness that you can try to come against you. no shadow that can over overcome his life. Again, number 144, anything is possible.
nothing he can't do. There's no mountain too big. There's no ocean too deep. too maybe. Train up your children now to know, sorry Meg, to try to know their authority in Christ. Because uh, I know one time, and you know, we're not the norm. If you're looking for a normal church, you're in the wrong place. You really are. But uh, actually, that's not right. I think you're in the right place. <laughs> Thank you. She said this is normal church. We don't we don't have it all down pat yet, but we follow an old testament mode, New Testament mode. We follow a New Testament mode where it's not what you see these days normally. We're not there yet. We're still saying, what else, God? Show us how to be free in you. But, so yeah, you're right. Maybe this is more normal what, for church, what church should be. But I was going to say that we, we do things here that's not the norm in the church world. Let's put it that way. We were casting a devil out of a lady over there one night. She started just screaming during prayer. And she had already said she'd been into all this new agey stuff. She'd gotten into looking at crystals and predicting her life by crystals. Stay away from that stuff. Stay away from stuff that is clearly laid out in the Bible as not of God. And I could go more into that, but boy, I would raise some hackers today. But I am going to go into it soon because Halloween's coming up. But that's another story. So. We were over there casting out the devil from that lady. She just started, in the middle of prayer, started screaming crazy wild. Not the Holy Ghost either. So we started casting the devils out. And uh, it got him out of her. She got filled with the Holy Ghost after that. But uh, I saw people in the room who were terrified. And uh, started, uh, there was one person who doesn't go here, has never been to a service here except that prayer meeting. Uh, I haven't seen her since. <laughs> That's why. But uh, she, uh, she started going, oh, I plead the blood of Jesus. 
Oh, I believe the blood of Jesus. Well, I could see you right there. That's total fear. She wasn't, she was using a formula she had heard. I believe the blood of Jesus. And it was just fear. You could feel it all over her. The best thing for that right there is just for her to, you know, slide over and somebody go pray for her. But I want these children to be brought up with no fear of that. Yeah. When they see that, there's no fear. Because I look, I think about it, you know, you've got Brantley and Corbin and Haven. And, well, yours, yours is about grown, but still young women of God. And, you know, you got the awesome boys. Mighty warriors on the football, baseball field. <laughs> Oh, we probably left out some. You got Hattie, Chloe, you got Malachi. Who else I left out? There's some not here. Here's the thing. I want them to be so moving in the authority of God that they can just take authority. Like, I oh, I had that vision. God just, I suddenly had to, during our worship, I had to get real quiet. And I just felt the Holy Ghost overwhelm me. And he showed me a vision of, like, spirits of infirmity. And they look like snakes. I saw them writhing like snakes. Now, that's nothing to be scared of. See, that's the thing. I don't want anybody to be like, oh, that's here? Or what's she doing? I don't want I don't want that. I want us to be to train up our kids especially. And I think they're pretty bold warriors already. I think we need to train up our kids that when something like that happens, they jump right in there with us and say, that's right, Sister Leslie, I'm with you. Cast them out of here. Get them out in the name of Jesus. Because we have that authority to tell them to go. We're not scared. I'm not scared of that stuff. I used to be like, I used to, and this was not correct. I used to anoint that uh, front door on Sunday mornings and just talk about unclean spirits. Stay out of here. But then I realized, no, I don't. I want. I want the people with them to come. I started to say, God, bring the people who are possessed, <coughs> oppressed, full of unclean spirits. Bring them, Lord. Because they need to be set free. That's the thing. We need to look at this as a good thing when we can see people set free, when we can see demonic things cast out. We have the authority. God gave me a dream one night where he showed me, and while I was in Wanakoba, he showed me keys, and he was giving me keys. We have the keys. Yeah. We have the keys. So when we tell things to go, I literally say, I close that gate in the name of Jesus. I, and God gave me keys, and I lock it, and you're not coming yes. back. Yes. So if you feel something like this try to creep into your life, don't stand in any fear. Because if you know Jesus, you have that authority. And you just speak it even in your house and say, get out. Every night, I'm, I'm, I'm already preaching. It's not the sermon, but I'm already preaching to you right now. And I'm going to give you a chance to say what you feel from God before I go into anything else. I've told you this before, but I need to say it again. Before I go to bed at night, I repent. Every night I repent. Lord, whatever, show me. What have I done? I don't get all introspective and guilty feeling and condemned. I just say, Lord, show me. When you show me, I'll repent. And I say, if I feel nothing, then I'll say, Lord, whatever I did today that displeased you, I'm so sorry. Thank you for your blood sacrifice. And I receive that forgiveness. It's done. It's done. I'm just clean slate again. You too. So do this. Don't carry that guilt. But when I go to bed, I say, any portals, that's an open door. Any portals in my house that's been allowed to come open to anything bad, evil, whether through strife, through uh, something on TV that shouldn't have been on the TV, or, or something on the internet, or something my kids did downstairs that I don't know about. Any portals. It's been open. I close them in the name of Jesus. And I seal them with the blood of Jesus. And then I go a step further. I say, if any unclean spirits that entered this house because of something we opened up, evil, I mean, we don't do anything intentionally, but you know, you don't know that your strife isn't bringing in stuff. The Bible says where there's envy and strife, there's confusion and every evil work. So when strife comes into your house, when it's done and y'all repented each other and asked forgiveness, as we should, as we do, then you say, those spirits of strife, get out. In the name of Jesus, you're not staying here. And then you just start praising God and just ask the Holy Spirit just to fill your house. And you go to bed in that total peace. And I feel like that's going to help somebody. I don't know who, but it'll help somebody here this morning or somebody watching. Now, what do you feel? I 
students feel that when we get in our mind that when we're casting a devil out of somebody or maybe they're oppressed and there's something tormenting them, they're not possessed, but they're being tormented, love has to be the motive. When we get love in our mind of the love for that person that they mm -hmm. don't deserve to be tormented because Jesus paid the price for that already, mm -hmm. then we're not going to walk in fear. You know, we quote the scripture a lot, perfect love casts out fear, and we it was probably written in relation to like his perfect love casts fear out of us. But he also showed me that it casts fear out of us a different way. When we walk in perfect love toward others, yeah. that casts out fear. We are able to overcome that fear of, you know, sometimes stepping out to pray for somebody who needs it because we are walking in his perfect love toward that person. That's good. So it casts fear out of us. Not to say you won't feel an inkling of fear. As you know your authority more and more, that's going to totally go. That's good. But step out because love is more important than fear. She said that's really, really good. Right? And I feel that sometimes, you know, when you get into that kind of realm of things, you'll have a lot of people, even in the Christian world, that will tell you, oh, that, don't get involved. Oh, they, they believe in casting out demons. They believe in devil, you know, demon possession and the supernatural and all that kind of stuff. Don't, don't go there. Don't get into that. You got to know you, you can't take either part of the Bible at some parts of the Bible you do take and some you don't. You know, it's it's all there. It's oh, all in the Word. You know, we know Jesus cast out demons. And I don't think after God, when Jesus left the earth, the devil was like, oh, he's gone. All right, let's pack up demons. Let's go. We'll yeah. just leave the world alone. We're done. And so, um, if, I would just, just, if people try to come at you, because they will, because they ha always have to the people here. If they come to you and try to dissuade you thinking, oh, the supernatural, this or all that, you know, just know that it's it's all, we got to take all of his word. And, you know, but the good news is, like they said, we have authority and it's nothing to fear. We have the third authority and it, it's nothing to fear, but just yeah. make sure it's all by his word yes. and in line with, with his word. Yes, that's good because... You know, we're going somewhere. It's not just us. There's churches all over the world with this same mindset of we want to get so close to what the Word says. What does the Word say? Because if the Word says it, we're supposed to be doing it. If Jesus says greater works than I'm doing, y'all won't know, then we're supposed to be doing it. It's there. So we have got to move in that. That's good words. Anybody else? Is it hot in here? Bears on 70, I think. I don't know how to get any lower. This one. This work. Anybody else, you feel anything from the Lord? Or just got a testimony? Because he's so good. You know, when you when you do things like cast out devils or cast out things, the, the end result is joy. Because you like she said, the love of God in our hearts for the other people who need to be free because Jesus loves them and wants them free. The end result is joy. Joy. Anybody else? I have a testimony about my brother. Um, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, he's in Indiana in a um, reco recovery program. Uh, Holy Ghost still one, too. Yeah. And he um, has been clean for, I think, about a month, maybe, a little over a month. And he's t I talked to him yesterday on the phone, and he was talking about how, you know, God had changed his heart. This time it was like before, you know, he had it in his head, but now he has it in his heart. Praise God. You know, to stay clean and so close to God, and they do. They have like uh, they have church every day. That's awesome. There. At the rehab. Yeah, the rehab. Yeah, and uh, I'm just really thankful for that because that's been a, a big answer prayer for us. We've been praying for a long time, and we were scared. We, you know, he was close to dying pretty much. He was on his way, but um, I thank God for answering his prayers. Yeah. And, uh, I'm just really thankful. Me, Haley's mom is there too, and I think she's going to stay too. Your mom? Haley, Haley's mom. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, good. She's going to stay too. So I'm just praising God. Me, y'all, I am praising <laughs> Those two are so dear to me that she set her up there. Uh, he only got to come here like once or so. I know there was more trouble, and he, anyway, had to go away, but. Uh, I felt such a call of God in his life, such a call of God. He's got such a knowledge of the Word already. But 
I'm going I'm to say this too. I'm already preaching again. The Holy Ghost baptism makes such a difference. Yeah, it does. Because, um, and I would never say a name with private issues, but somebody that is, I don't think, ever, ever been here for a Sunday morning service? They got another church somewhere else out of town. But they were talking about a relative of theirs that went to a rehab for drug issues, and it was a Christian based rehab, so that is really good. That's the key right there. Mm -hmm. But um, I asked them, they said he ended up going back to everything, and he was back, and I think now he's, I don't know, maybe in prison again now. And I said, well, he, he got filled with the Holy Ghost, right, while he was there. And they're like, no. I'm like, did they not, did they not teach that as a, you know, what you, uh, there's a power there. When you're baptized, now, if you're already saved, the Holy Spirit's in you. Don't take what I'm saying wrong. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit's in you. But there is something different with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus told him in Acts chapter 1, they'd already been casting out devils. They'd already been, they'd seen the dead raised. They'd been healing the sick already, all the apostles. They had power with Jesus there with them. But he said, I'm getting ready to go away. And he said, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase this, and then I'm going to go back and read you the real scripture. It's like Jesus was saying, so I know y'all probably think y'all can go out and start doing all this stuff again, but don't do it. Wait. And he didn't say don't do it. What he said is wait until you be endued with power. This is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He said, wait until you're endued with power. And then you're going to go be my witnesses, he said. He started right where they were, and then he broadened the scope and basically said to the whole world, you're going to go out. He knew they needed a power flowing through them constantly to go out and be effective witnesses. So if a person's not baptized in the Holy Ghost, then boy, this flies against all the doctrine I was taught in Pentecostal churches, but I, I can't tell a lie. I'm going to tell you the truth that as I see it. I don't believe for a second that people who have come to Jesus and surrendered their lives to them are going to hell just because they've never spoken in tongues or something. I don't believe that. The Bible doesn't back it up. However, there's power that comes with that baptism that you're not going to have until you're baptized. Do you need to say something about that? I know she had some revelation on that this week. I'm about to teach on that again. Just I was going to say, right? too, um, my brother received it the first day that he went. Yeah. I think it was like, like the first week or something Praise like that. Praise God. Yeah. See what I'm talking <laughs> about? It makes the difference. Yeah. And so that's why I said to this, my friend, I said, he, your, your relative needs <sighs> It's not going to mean you're perfect. It just means there's an increased power flowing through you that wasn't there before. It was there, but now you've let it emerge. It's you've so just let it emerge. It's baptized you. It's kind of like it's, it's like activated. Ooh, it was activated. like it was, it was there, and it's not that it couldn't do anything or you couldn't move in it at all. Yeah, but it's right. like, and it's like you know, I know people who you know born again Christians who will like feel something in the spirit or something, and it's like because it's like it can. Happened in an instant, but when you get baptized in it, it's like it, it's like it's activated, and it's like you're flowing in it like all the time. Like it's mm -hmm. it's it's different. It's like a, a whole other level that it. I mean, for lack of a better term, it, it's almost like God superpowers. Like it. That's kind of what it feels like. You you start discerning things. You it starts changing you and making you feel more confident and uh, it's your voice clear your voice clear yeah i think we're going to, have to keep going down this path just a little bit longer um, i feel that in the holy ghost i mean i have a sermon it's good but uh, i feel like we're going to have to go a little further down this path right now because it's time to clear up some things with regard to the Holy Ghost baptism. Now, a lot of y'all been in Pentecost a long time. Some of y'all been in Pentecost. I was 19 when I came into it. Um, and we, we may all preach this sermon this morning. We'll go as the Holy Ghost leads, but it's time to clear up some misconceptions. I had some uh, friends on Facebook who uh, I went to church with for years in, in, in Winston. And they began to post about the baptism of the Holy Ghost this past week, and it was very troubling. And I was reading it all going, wait a minute, we went to church together for years, and we were taught this stuff, but it seemed like y'all had different ideas, different opinions, different, and they were um, 
It was troubling, very troubling. They didn't really argue, but they, the, they could have, but they showed the love of God. That's good. But uh, we, we need to know what this is. And you go help me out with this. Anybody that feels you help me out. Get some of that stuff you the other night that you felt. She's had some revelation on this. I want to clarify this, and I've taught this so much, but there's people here that's never heard it, I think, in this teaching. The Bible says, a lot of times in the New Testament, receive, receive, receive the word of God, receive the Holy Ghost. Same word in English, right? In the Greek, it's not the same word. That's why we talk about the Bible says, study to show yourself approved. We, I am feeling, thanks to Belinda, thank you, sister, for bringing this to my knowledge, I feel like we need to do a Bible study very soon on how to teach people to use a concordance, how to teach people to go back and see what a word really means in the original language. Because the translation into English, we may not get exactly what it used to mean. It's real easy to do to use concordances and things like that, lexicons. You're like, wait a minute, don't throw out these big words. Trust me, it's all online now. I used to have to get books and sit and flip and put on little glasses and see it. It's all online now. I can teach you how to do it. We can teach you how to do it. Belinda suggested that, and I'm like, yes, sister. So when you go back and you look at what those words really mean, receive, receive, receive. There's two main ones in the Greek. Go ahead and give me some scripture, Mary. Give me some of those received scriptures. Give me Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. Sorry. Did I go? Can go. Oh, she's good. The first receive, and if you've heard this, you need to hear it again. The first receive is a Greek word, dikomai. I don't speak Greek, but I'm, phonetically I can do it. And I'm going to give you the example again. Hey, give us some money. I'll give yeah. it. So here's a dollar, okay? Here's Belinda. Okay, hold out your hand, Belinda. <clears throat> See this? I'm going to put this right in her hand. She's going to grasp it. She just received it. That's dickle In other words, I put it right out there. She just took it. She didn't have to do anything, except she just took it. She didn't have to, like, come get it from me. It's right there. Dekomai is a passive type of receiving. It's when somebody gets married. I'm teaching you the word right now. It's when, hold on to that. I'll take it back because it doesn't go in the offering. Somebody's like, hey, put $10 in there. She gave us Belinda. But if you're in a wedding reception line, I don't know how they do it anymore, but back in the day, you know, when you got married, then you go to the door of the church. This is old school. Like maybe when, when y'all got married, and I, I'm sorry, not that you're old. Oh, we are old. <laughs> Woo! So they did that. So, Let's say when they got married, perhaps. You know, you go stand at the door, and everybody comes by you, takes your hand, says, congratulations, so happy for you. And I use them. Thank you. Thank you. That's dekomai. You're just receiving. You're not really doing anything. You're just taking it right there. It is. Okay. <clears throat> Here's this dollar bill. That woman right there wants it. She wants it. She's hungry for that dollar bill. And that right there it is. And I'm not keeping it from her. But, maybe let's do it again. That was good. She wants it bad. That's what I'm talking about right there. And there's a big difference in what she just did and what she did a while ago. Now, the first one is Dickelmai. She just passively received it. You can look this up in the Greek. There's verbs. If you went, Okay, I'm taking you back to high school. South Stoke, wherever y'all went. But so you're going back to passive verbs and active verbs. There's a difference. And the Greek will tell you that dekomai is that passive with the second verb. And it'll tell you that there's another word for receive used in the New Testament, which is the word lambano. Girl, lambano, that thing. This lambano right there is an active verb. You want it. You are going after it. You're going after it. Two totally different verbs. Your English just says receive. So when you look at it, you, you don't see any difference, but there is. Okay, I'm putting this back in the offering just as a verification. So when it talks about, here I am. 
I am, uh, let's pretend I'm Philip. I don't look at Sandy like Philip, but let's say I'm the disciple here, and I'm Philip. And I'm going down to, was it Samaria he went to in that day? Suppose that again. <clears throat> so I'm going down to Samaria. And I'm going to preach the word to y'all. Jesus. I'm preaching Jesus because he's already, you know, been born, grew up, died, resurrected, went on up to heaven. So it's, it's after the baptism of John the Baptist. But it's in the real times like us now where Jesus has already gone back and he's poured out the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so I go preach the word to all y'all in Samaria. And you believe it. And you're back there and Sean's like, yeah, I received that. He's been a good Jew all his life. And he, not that he really is, but in the Bible. And he's a he's a he's a, been a good Jew, and a good Jew would never receive this Jesus message. But he hears Philip preach the word, and he's like, "I believe him. I receive that right now." And what he just did is tickle my head. That passive receiving the word of God deep down inside him is there. And when he does that, the Lord is already with him. Right there, he received the word. The Bible says this. Can you find any example of that in Acts 8 where it says Philip preached? Was it 19? Where's Philip preached? Try 8. Try 8. Or anybody, whoever finds it, y'all tell me. So when Philip preaches that word, they receive it. Now I want you to think about it. Because some people, I was I was brought up in Pentecost, but they don't have anything yet. Till they speak in other tongues, they don't have anything yet. That's not true. Because when you receive the word, who is the word? Who? Jesus. John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was. Woo! The Word was God. Jesus is the Word. The Word, the Word, the Word. They received Him. They received the Word. The Word is in them. So, yeah, they got something all right. They got Jesus. And really, you know, there's a big controversy between the Trinity, the oneness peoples. They all sort of believe the same thing, don't even know it. But here's the thing. Jesus said when he promised the Holy Spirit in John, the book of John, before he was crucified and all, he said the Holy Spirit's coming. What he said was, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. He said, I will come to you. You hear that? He said, I will come to you. So when you receive the word, which is Jesus, and you truly receive it. I'm not just saying you listen and say, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Sure. No, I mean you receive it. Like they did when Philip went and preached to him. You have Jesus right then. Did you find that where the receive is? What's it say? Um, we need to prove this by the word. Don't you take my word for it. What does this say? Well, in the word received, it's in chapter 8 when he went to there. Well, in the King James, it says, and they received the word in one of those. I'll let her find it. Just keep talking, Mom. Yeah, yeah. I don't have it. Because it I could be 19. It, it when he went, somebody went and preached to somebody. Trust me, I think it was Phil. And when he went down there, he said, they said, and they received the word. They received the word. But then, Peter, and I forget who it was. Was it Peter and John? Some of them up who was still somewhere else heard about it. I'm telling you the Bible story right now. They heard, hey. Those people down there in that other city have received the word of God. They received it. That's good. So now let's us go down there and talk to them about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So they went down, and we're going to actually read, just start in Acts 8 and just read some of the scriptures through there. And we're going to read 19 as well. I don't know if we'll do 10, but we'll read 8 and 19, definitely. Okay. Um, Listen to this. We'll talk about Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For And it talks about the different miracles that took place, and there was great joy in the city. Um, and then, for when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Um, it talks about Simon. And it says in verse 14, now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, that's it. Received. They sent them. They sent unto them Peter and John. That's the one I was looking for. So, when the other disciples somewhere else heard that Samaria had received the word, they sent unto them Peter and John. Keep reading. 
verse 15, who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. All right, let's stop right there. Because there could be, I don't think it's y'all, but it could be people watching who are like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was taught at my church that as soon as I got saved, I had the Holy Ghost. Let's clarify that. When you're saved and you truly receive the word, we've already said that. He comes to live in you. He said it. So, yeah, the Spirit of the Lord, because who is that Spirit? So the Spirit of the Lord is in you. But you've not been baptized necessarily in the Holy Ghost yet. That's why they sent unto them Peter and John to say, hey, you know, have you have you been baptized in the Holy Ghost? They're like, no. But they'd already been baptized in water. So these people have already received the word of God, and they've already been baptized in water. So they've gone through most of the steps that the modern church world goes through. They say, yes, I believe all this and make Jesus my Savior and all that, and then I, I'm going to get baptized in water. And they stop right there. <coughs> Do you see this? Do you see the enemy's trick right here? through the centuries to stop the church from going where they need to go. He's tried to stop them through lies and he can't. But he's been successful with a lot of churches that listen all through the centuries here since Jesus because they say, that's it, I can stop right there. Well, you can. And I believe that if you fought, continue to follow Jesus, you can still go on to heaven. But there's so much more. There's so much more. That's why Peter and John went down there and said, have y'all been baptized in the Holy Ghost yet? No, just in water. And then they laid their hands on them, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Can you read that? Verse 17, then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Is there any more to that, or is that about the end of that little chapter? It's, that's the story about Simon. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw the Holy Ghost already. Now, the Holy Ghost... It said, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Now we're taking that English word. And what we're saying is this this is what I came up in in Pentecost for 21 years. Starting at age 19. I was uh, taught that until you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, you're not really saved. You still have danger to go to hell. If you got killed in a car wreck, you'd still go to hell. That's not true. That's not true. The promise of the Father is still there for you, but it's not true. If you've accepted Jesus and I don't even been baptized in water and stuff, that you're going to be doomed because you didn't get baptized with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, if you think I'm downgrading the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I'm not. I believe we all need that to move in the power of God that we want to see. But we took that word, the church world, took that uh, phrase, fallen upon, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Because what does that sound like? Y'all, this is the will of God today that I teach this. I feel it. We don't even have to have that private meeting, brother, right here. Well, this is it, what I was going to teach. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. So what it makes it look like, sorry, go ahead, my hands are clean. But it makes it look like she has not got anything yet. She's not got anything yet. It's what it seems like because that term fallen upon means like she's still waiting on something else. It'll fall on her. But when you look up that term fallen upon in the Greek, it just it, it can usually mean just take full possession of. You see that? What a difference. What a difference than seeing that there's something separate that you're waiting on just to fall on you as to say that what's already in you just needs to take full possession. The baptism. And that you can look it up in the Greek. Trust me. I, I did, you, hey, no, don't trust me. Go look it up. In the Greek, that term fallen upon can mean just totally take possession of. So let's let's uh, we're not changing the Bible. We're going back to the original Greek. And we're saying they went to him and said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, No, we've just been baptized in water in the name of Jesus. And uh and so then they say, for as yet, he had not taken full possession of them. You see the difference? Instead of falling upon like something that's not there yet. So here's what I've seen. Since God clearly showed me what that Greek was and that whole received thing between the passive decomai and the active lumbano, I'm going after it. 
Once God showed me that, I started praying for people a different way. It was no more, let's say Belinda wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost, it was no more that I'm going to start praying for her and, because I don't think she's got anything, so I'm going to pray, sister, you need him to fall on you so you can go to heaven. No, I started praying for her as if he's already in her. And all he needs to do is immerse her. For as yet he was fallen upon, for as yet he was had not taken full possession of her. It's like he was there. She'd invited him in, and he's sitting on the couch in the living room. He's there. But did Belinda say, go to the refrigerator, get you something to eat? Are you sleepy? Go to the bedroom. Help yourself to the bathroom. You've got the whole house here. Take it on. There's a difference. For as yet, he had not taken full possession of her. So, what did they do? It says that Peter and John laid hands on him, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Now, this is one instance that it doesn't tell exactly what happened. It doesn't say, and they were baptized in the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. It doesn't say that there. It does in other places. But we know something visible or audible happened because Simon the sorcerer had been following around the disciples trying to see what was going on, and he says he got saved, I guess. But it says when Simon saw what happened, he was like, oh, give me that power. I want that power y'all got. And they were like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're coming after this the wrong way. But I want you to go back to what happened. Simon saw something happen. I can pray for Belinda right now to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. No, she already is. Let's pretend she's one of the people down there in Samaria. And so I pray for her, and I say, lift your hand, sister. She lifts the hand up. And she's praying, and then I just pray for her, receive the Holy Ghost. All right, it's done. There was, there was no evidence it was done. But see, I've already believed he's already in her. But there was no evidence that there was a baptism. There was no evidence that there was an immersion in him. What happened here, there was some kind of evidence. Because Simon saw it and was like, whoa. Oh, well, that power y'all got. What y'all just saw. See the Holy Ghost, nothing happened, you know. Y'all be like, okay. But if I lay hands on her and she starts speaking in other tongues or prophesying, as one account says, y'all gonna be like, okay, okay, okay. I know that that is not natural in her. Something supernatural just happened. I want whatever power y'all got is what Simon said. So even though this is one account that did not mention that somebody spoke in other tongues, more than likely, I believe they did. They either did that or prophesied. As Megan said the other night, it was some kind of ecstatic utterance that came out because Simon was a witness to it. Go to 19. Are you there? I didn't know if you feel something else with that. We need this. We've got to know what is truth. And I don't think I have all the truth yet, but who is in me has truth, and he'll reveal it. Uh, chapter 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. I'm going to stop right there. Because she had just heard her say the word received. Did y'all hear that? That's Acts 19. Good scriptures for y'all to study. If you don't understand this, study these. Back in Acts 8, I'm going backwards and it ties into this. When it says, and they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost, the word there again is the active one, lumbano. It's not the decomaive, I received the word already. I believe it, I received it. No, now there's that other verb that's active, I lumbano the Holy Ghost. So you have scriptures here where both receives are used together. In the same verse even sometimes. But the first time it'll mean that calm receiving. And the other time it means that I'm grabbing hold of it receiving. That's what happens when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's lumbano. You take a hold of it. Keep reading, Meg. And so they said we've never so much heard of any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John the Baptist. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, yes. and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Okay. There was an evidence there. When the Holy Ghost, and again, when you look up all these words, came upon them, fell upon them, it really means just totally filled them. They spoke in tongues and prophesied. Because one of the arguments on, uh, well, it wasn't really an argument. It was a peaceful discussion on Facebook the other night among my friends was, uh, well, what's the evidence of the Holy Ghost? Couldn't the evidence just be love and joy and peace and all the fruit of the Spirit? Does it have to be all this other stuff? Here's the thing. We go with the example we have in the Word. And in the Word, in the book of Acts, every time somebody was baptized in the Holy Ghost, there was a visible or audible evidence every time. So you can't tell yet who's going to show love and who's going to show joy and who's going to show peace and all the fruit of the Spirit until after they've been flowing in the Spirit. And fruit here, doesn't happen overnight. Fruit actually grows. Thank you. That's Sometimes great. Sometimes it does, but fruit grows. That's good. Thank you, Paul. Fruit doesn't happen overnight. It grows. That's good. And here's the thing. I know people who don't believe in Jesus who are loving. i got friends who don't even believe in Jesus who would give me the shirt off their back. And they're, they're, they seem to be happy, some of them. I believe in the long run there's something missing, of course, without Jesus. But, you know, when you're starting to just say, well, if that person shows love, I believe that they probably are baptized in the Spirit. And then you find out they're Buddhist. And you're like, wait a minute, no, that doesn't work. So the fruit is something that grows out of that baptism of the Holy Spirit. You keep flowing in it. Now, if you just get baptized and you just quit and say, oh, I'm good. I got it back in 1973 and it's been in church since. You're not going to flow and the fruit's not going to come. But we're talking about the fact that you can't look at just somebody's joy or peace or kindness necessarily and say, oh, they must be baptized in the Holy Ghost because the Word's evidence here. Every time. Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost was first poured out, you know what happened. The place was, you know, it was shaken and they, they tongues of fire shot out of their heads. And if you think that can't happen, you're wrong. It happened to my uncle. When my uncle was baptized in the Holy Ghost, Southern Baptist preacher. Boy, they didn't believe that. I grew up Southern Baptist. I love my Southern Baptist friends. My relatives are all sitting right up the road, and I love them. I believe they're saved. But the thing is, they didn't know about this teaching we're doing right now, so it was foreign to them. And they stayed away from it because of that. But my uncle heard about it because his wife got filled with the Holy Ghost. That would do it, y'all. We'll get a spouse filled, and the other was like, I can't stand it. I'm either going to leave you or I'm going to get it. Hope they get it. But my uncle was baptized in the Holy Ghost, and fire shot out. He told us a story again. He's 95, Mom? I think so. He told us a story. It happened years ago. Fire shot out. In fact, didn't it, like, knock the lamps over in the hotel room where those preachers were praying for him, and fire just went out? It can happen that way. Now, it doesn't have to happen that way. That's the only example, biblically, that we have that fire came out. But it, he did say he baptized you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I believe that's a spiritual fire. But every evidence, Acts chapter 2, it says, And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, as the Spirit gave utterance. <coughs> See, that, that's what the Spirit does. The Spirit gives an utterance of some kind. Because look at this. If I go like this, praise Jesus. That's good. But anybody can do that. Somebody who's not even saved yet can go to a church and feel the emotion of the music and rate, like, lift their hands. That doesn't mean you're saved or baptized in the Holy Ghost. I start jumping up and down. Hey, I, I came out of Pentecost, y'all, and I'm still in Pentecost, and I want us to liven it up, too. But, you know, the Holy Ghost moves with sometimes a different kind of movement here. But there's times, y'all. I saw the Holy Ghost hit you at the altar, what, a few months ago? She took, oh, Jesus, you know. Oh, I love it when that happens. One night, me, Belinda, and Katie's mama, Anita, we were having a prayer meeting. <laughs> Holy, Holy Ghost hit all three of us at the same time. Oh, Jesus. You know, you know in Pentecostal church, the parents go flying, and the bobby pins go flying, and the Holy Ghost hits sometimes. And that's the Spirit of the Lord. He moves in different ways. But I can do every bit of that. That doesn't mean I'm baptized in the Holy because the Spirit of the Lord can move upon anybody. But that doesn't mean he's moving in them necessarily. It can be, I hope it's both. So when we're talking about the evidence in Acts chapter 2, the evidence was speaking in other tongues. 
we go to Acts chapter 8, and we know there wasn't evidence because Simon said, Oh, I see that. I want it. Acts chapter 10. Read me a little bit of 10. She just read you 19. 19 said they'd already been baptized in John's baptism. But check this out, y'all. They got rebaptized. They'd already been baptized in John's baptism unto repentance. But they got baptized in the name of Jesus. That's why when I baptize y'all, I'm going to say the name of Jesus every time. I've had people argue with me, but you're just supposed to say Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Every single time in the book of Acts, somebody got baptized. It's in the name of Jesus. So I'll say it all. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, name of Jesus. His real name, Yeshua. Let's quit arguing about this stuff. I'm just sitting it straight right now. I had that lady that had that vision of me that I told y'all last week. She said I had to set some things straight and tell the truth according to the word. Let's quit arguing about how we baptize. If you got to argue because you're not sure how to say it, say it all. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, name of Jesus. You're never wrong to do anything you do in the name of Jesus ever. The Bible says do all things in the name of Jesus for the glory of God. So Acts 19, she's already read you when it says when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, they began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. So there's an ecstatic utterance, as, as they, a lot of people call it. Something came out that you know is not in the natural. See, if, if, if y'all pray for me right now and I'm not filled with the Holy Ghost and I start saying, praise God, glory to God, hallelujah, that doesn't mean I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's good. I'm praising God. That's good. That doesn't mean I'm baptized. But if y'all didn't know anything about all this, and, and all of a sudden y'all saw somebody lay hands on me, and I start speaking in other tongues, y'all going to be like, oh, whoa, that was not her. That was not her. That was him. Or if all of a sudden I started prophesying. I mean, immediately you know it's prophecy. You're like, that's not her. In the natural, that has to be him. So the examples we have of evidence of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts, when it was first being poured out, it was new every time something came out of their mouth that was of God. Okay. In Acts chapter 10 is when Peter is going to preach unto the Gentiles, and he goes through it talking about who Jesus knew he was, and then he says, it says, uh, Acts 10 verse 44, I'll start there. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Again. For they heard them speak with tongues. That little four, whenever you see a four, it means, you know, this happened, and we know it happened because of this. For and because are kind of similar. Well, this happened, for we heard them. You could have put a because in there. Because we heard them speak with tongues. And when you speak with tongues, you're magnifying God. It won't ever speak anything against God. So here's your evidences of this. Now, I'm going to clear up another common misconception that we need to know here to move in these things of the Spirit. But before I do, is there anything else that you want to say that you felt the other night? If y'all need to get up and move around, get up and move around. Come on back, because I know it's time. Do you feel to say that now? It's up to you. Okay, well, I'll let Sam when you feel it. I feel like now, and if you have a question, I'll answer it. I felt to go this way. I did not, I just, this is Holy Ghost. I feel that I've cleared up some common misconceptions, which is, do you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven? No. Should you speak in other tongues? Yeah. For power and anointing, absolutely. Because see, he who is in you can take full possession of you and you start speaking in tongues like that. We're not waiting on something to come fall on you that ain't already there. It's already there. And that's what I was going to say earlier that I stopped before I said it is, once I started to pray for people this way, with this knowledge, everything changed. Because I had spent years in churches where people would want the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they'd seek it for weeks, months, years. And I do mean years. But bless brother, what's it? I won't say his name. Had a good old brother. When I went up to seek the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it took 
two months. Shouldn't have. But the teaching was faulty. I thought I didn't have anything. And I had to be good enough to get it, you know. No, I already had him. If somebody had just said to me, Leslie, you're safe now. He's in you. Come on, just let him take full possession. I'd have been speaking in tongues like that, but I wasn't taught that. They didn't know any better. I'm not mad at anybody. But, and they're good people. They got way better teachings on other things than I do, but on this, we got to correct it. But, I saw people go, for so long without this brother so-and-so, died and never spoke in tongues or anything. And I saw him go to the altar Sunday morning, mm -hmm. Sunday night, Wednesday night for years. He was up there when I was 19 praying. And when I left the church, I think he was still praying. I think he'd already gone to another church at that point. No, if somebody could have just said to him, you're saved. I pray he was such a precious man. Oh, dear, I just saw that and I started crying. I, he was such a precious man. I pray he didn't, you know, die and think he didn't have anything yet. And then, but thank God Jesus would have welcomed him right there and said, he had me all along. But when I watched a video of some of the folks who were at my old church and they're somewhere else now, but when I watched a video, it's probably been five, six years ago, I saw this precious woman. Oh, how I love her. I saw her and she was at the altar just praying to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And people were, you know, doing what we do, slapping them on the back, laying hands on their head, and doing all the things to try to get them to break through and get it. She was still praying. People of God, she was praying when I left that church in 2002 to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. There's no excuse for this. She already has him. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, God, please just let me, I should have gone to found, I should have gone and found her. I should have gone and found her and said, come on, let's pray, girl. Since God showed me this, this way by the word, here at the well, if anybody is truly saved and wants the Holy Ghost, it happens that day. You know, sometimes I've seen it, you know, when somebody, you know, you feel a, something trying to hold them back, Sometimes it might take 30 minutes or something. Sometimes like that. But we've not had tarrying. You don't see us have an altar call up here and say, okay, here are all y'all that's been praying for 10 months, three years to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Y'all come on up here because maybe tonight's your night. False. False. If you're saved, he's in you. And all you got to do is just loosen up. Let him, let him speak. Let him speak. Everything changed. The evidence is also, the evidence of God is also in the fruit of what's born. And the fruit of years and years of praying, something's wrong there. Okay, now if you feel to throw in your thing, go ahead. But I'm going to clear up another misconception before we go. That was one question that was asked. Do you have to speak in tongues to go to heaven? No. But can you, if you're saved, absolutely you can. I'm going to clear this up. This, this is not a gift just for the holy ones. That sandy man, she's sanctified. She, so she probably can be baptized in the Holy Ghost, but some of y'all that, you know, you don't get up and pray every, you know, here. What? It's a free gift. Peter said in Acts 2.38, when they were, the people listening to him preach were pricked in their hearts, and they're like, what do we need to do? Don't misquote it. Don't misquote it the way a lot of churches do and say, what do I need to do to be saved? It doesn't say that. So they're like, oh, what do we need to do? You just told us we crucified the king of glory. What do we do? Peter said, repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's a free gift. And then he goes on, just in case y'all were wondering, is that me? He says, for, it's for, it's for all y'all, he says. And for your children. And as many as are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Everybody. So for the, for your friends who tell you, oh, that's over, man. That stuff doesn't happen anymore. Ask your friend nicely. Don't argue. Please don't argue with them. But you can talk. Can't we, brother? We've been talking about that. You can talk. And you can say, oh, that ended? Where does the Bible say that? And you wait, and they got no answer. Now they'll think they do. And I'm not making fun of them. I'm telling you that don't argue. Just wait. Because there's no Bible for it. And if there's no Bible for it, don't you believe it. 
So if they say, oh, that's for your tongue and all that stuff, it's over. No, it's not. Give me Bible to prove it. So they're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And they're going to read the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that says, you know, knowledge is going to pass away. Tongues are going to cease. And See, there they'll say to you, it ended. It says tongues will cease. <coughs> Did knowledge pass away? Somebody give me a big, loud answer. Did knowledge pass away? No. no. So why are we taking half of that scripture to prove our point and leaving the other one? Tongues will cease one day. Knowledge will pass. There's going to come a time when everything is made perfect when he's here. When it, when it all comes together at the end, it's all going to be made perfect. We're not going to have a need for some things anymore. But we'll be with him. But right now, we do still have a need. So when they take you to that scripture and say, Did, but see, that says tongues are going to cease. Well, not yet. Now, the final thing I'm going to clear up, and if you have a question, I want to hear it. The final thing I'm going to clear up is this. Some say that the gift of tongues and the gift of the Holy Ghost is the same thing. It's not. Because it did, Peter didn't say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of tongues. He didn't say that, did he? He said, you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul, later in 1 Corinthians, you can look, chapter 12 is a good one to read, Third, go and throw in 13, that's a great one, 14. So remember that, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 talks about this. There, Paul talks about the gift of tongues. It's a different thing. When you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, some sort of ecstatic utterance comes out. And I don't mean, praise God, hallelujah. I mean, again, that's good stuff, but that's not evidence. Spirit speaking through you. Spirit speaking, thank you. Spirit speaking through you, either in other tongues, and I've had to throw in that whole prophetic utterance because it says that people can prophesy when they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. But you, it'll be, you'll know. Oh, that's not them. And as we said the other night, I believe anybody that prophesies is going to be able to yeah. speak in tongues. Yeah. So, the gift of the Holy Ghost endues you with your own, people call it a prayer language. I mean, I guess that's okay. The Bible doesn't say that, but we can call it that. It, it's uh, speaking in other tongues. It endues you with that for your private prayer time. It could even be when you're here in the public. As long as it doesn't take over the service. Like, uh, I'm sure I'm sure Deborah's sitting back there. She's baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm sure when she's worshiping, sometimes she's speaking in other tongues here in public. Some people will tell you that's wrong. No, it's not. She's not taking over the service. You'll hear me up here. Because people of God, when you're, whew, when you're going deep in the Spirit, you're going to pray in the Spirit, which means you're going to pray in other tongues. Because you're praying out something that you don't understand in the natural. So the Lord is praying this through you. So when you see me up here, sometimes the Spirit is talking to me. And I'll start speaking in other tongues. It didn't stop, y'all. I was speaking in other tongues up here today. But guess what? Y'all kept worshiping. It didn't take over the service. Y'all kept on singing, didn't you? Raising your hands. Because we can do that. That's okay. I have a friend who goes to a church in this town. She's baptized in the Holy Ghost. She got baptized right here. And she went back to her church. And at the altar, she was speaking in tongues. Not loud. She wasn't taking over. And the ushers came and got her and took her out. Said, nope, nope, nope. Not here. Not unless it's interpreted, they said. She wasn't doing anything wrong. She was just praying privately, her and the Lord. Now, you might could have heard her, but it's not messing you up. Now, if all of a sudden, Sandy right there stands up in the middle of church, and y'all all singing, praising, and she stands up and starts speaking in tongues really loud, you'll know when that's of God. You'll know there's a message coming through right here that we need to hear. And you'll feel it in your spirit. You'll get quiet. And you'll listen. And then when she's done, the Lord's done speaking through her, there will be an interpretation that comes forth from somebody. It could be her. It could be one of y'all. That all of a sudden, God starts giving you within yourself what she was saying in the Spirit. And you'll tell us. 
That's the gift of tongues. Now, when she's praying at home in her prayer closet, speaking in other tongues, that's the Holy Ghost. That's the language of the Holy Ghost flowing through her. That's for all of us. Not all of y'all are going to move in the gift of tongues. So again, get that clear. The gift of the Holy Ghost and the gift of tongues, they're related, but they're not the exact same thing. The gift of tongues is a spiritual gift that flows from the Holy Ghost to be used in a gathering of God's people to give a message from heaven. But it has to have an interpretation in that case. So if I was to stand up here all of a sudden and start just speaking in tongues the whole service, y'all are going to look at me like, I don't know what she's saying. Where's the sermon? I don't get it. That'd be out of order unless there's an interpretation. Do you see that? Is that clear? So I hear preachers. Oh, I'm like, God help us. And God correct me where I'm wrong. Lord, I humble myself. Show me where I'm wrong. I want to know truth. But I hear preachers preaching about the Holy Ghost and they say I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost and they'll say I have the gift of tongues God gave me the gift of tongues that's different now I felt to go here it was the will of God ask me what you need to ask me it's not a typical sermon but yet it is it goes deeper some, than some sermons what do you need to ask me? There's no dumb question, as I used to say when I taught high school. It's never a dumb question. Can I just say real quick? You may think, well, why tongues? And I saw a lot of people debating, saying, well, and I'm seeing it different people. Oh, my mom. A lot of people debating, well, saying, well, like you were saying, or look, it can be the fruit of the Spirit, all these different things. That, that can all be evidence of the baptism. And I was, I just was listening to a sermon on it, and I was like, God, this just doesn't feel right. And I turned it off and said, I only want to hear what you hear what you hear, what you want me to hear. And I started thinking about it, and even this morning, more clarity. When I'm talking to you right now, where is that coming from? Your heart. My heart, my mind. Like, there is something within me that is then translating it through my body. When I speak, I'm saying what was already in here, inside. So when the Spirit is speaking through you, through tongues, through prophecy, where He's the one speaking, that's evidence of what's on the inside. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else that did mo that shows completely that he's taken over your heart than that coming out. There's always a link in the Bible with what you speak. Uh, what did Jesus say? Uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's always that link between the heart and what your mouth speaks. Or you can say your mind and what your mouth speaks. So when the Spirit speaks through your tongue, that is evidence that he has captured, that he is inside of you and he has bypassed your own human mind. There is another voice speaking through you because they've done studies, researchers and scientists have plugged people up to machines and seen that when people speak in tongues, there is no thought process for speech we that takes place. We showed the video here from CBS News or with an ABC. ABC or CBS, ABC. like they're, they're nightly worldwide yeah. news. They did a study, and the part of your brain that speaks, that is moving when we're, I'm talking right now, it was completely silent. It was dead. Yep. So it's not you speaking, it's the Spirit speaking. That's why it's the evidence, because it's revealing what is inside of you. That's good. It is revealing what has happened in your heart. It has translated from your, His Spirit being linked up with your Spirit, and has been able to take over to the point that he bypasses your own mind. That's so good. That's why it's tongues that are, or we can say an ecstatic utterance. Yes. Yeah. That's good. You see that? That study took uh, other religions, Franciscan monks and all, and, and it had them do what they do, like chant. And the, this whole part of the brain for speech stayed on. But the people baptized in the Holy Ghost, when they start speaking in tongues, do we? Because it's it's evidence of who's in you. I've had other people ask me, why do you think it, he used that, speaking in other tongues? This is my opinion. The uh, disciple James wrote that the tongue is like the most evil member of the body. Because with it we can bring forth blessing or cursing. The tongue is hard to control. James said, 
He said, somebody who's mastered the tongue? Wow. Yeah. So the tongue is a hard thing to tame. So I, I can see the logic there of God saying, I'm going to take the thing that's hardest to tame naturally, and I'm going to take it over. And I'm going to speak my language. You won't understand it necessarily. Sometimes he'll give you a sense of what you're saying. But a lot of times you won't understand. And you'll say, that's just gibberish, isn't it? Not when you're focusing on Jesus and you let him take over your tongue. It's not gibberish. So, any, come on, ask me something, and then I'll have Megan say it, brother. Well, if your tongue's gone, you can't speak anyway, correct? That's right. And I actually had somebody ask me that question. They said, in fact, I think I read an article of somebody who had had a tongue cut out. And they're like, well, how can they speak in other tongues? And I'm like, well, that's true. How could they? But what was it? We, we, did we talk about that? Somebody said that literally they could hear tongues in their head. And I do. There's times when I'm uh, feeling to pray. Let's say I'm in a town meeting up here and I want to pray in the spirit. I, I hate masks, but it was great to wear a mask for a while because you can just pray in tongues. You just be somewhere speaking in the spirit behind that mask. Nobody ever knew it. But, you know, sometimes I want to pray in the spirit. And I'll sit there and go, but I'll hear it in my head. Before it comes out, sometimes I'll hear it in my head what the Spirit is speaking. And I'll tell you sometimes, if you're wanting to get baptized in the Spirit and you're not, sometimes I'll say, you know you already, I feel it's about some people. You already hear it. Just release what you hear. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's almost like you yielding your tongue to Him. It's like a, like a baby. Who, because you've never spoken in tongues before, it's new to you. I've heard God take over a person's tongue, and as soon as they speak anything, it sounds like a message in tongues, like somebody's been speaking in tongues 40 years. It can happen that way. I love it when it does. But then I've had sometimes where people, I mean, they're praying for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and what they feel is their lips start trembling. And the Bible says this, Isaiah 28, check it out at home, Isaiah 28, 11 and 12, says, for with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to my people. That's a prophecy. How do we know it? Because the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, when he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he said this is what Isaiah was talking about. When Isaiah the prophet long ago said, they're going to speak, there's going to be stammering lips and another tongue. Paul said, this speaking in tongues is that. Proved it, Paul did. 1 Corinthians 14, I believe. So sometimes you'll just feel that trembling. And, and people, our minds just keep wanting to say, keep thinking, what can I say next? Praise Jesus, or did I say hallelujah? Or glory to God. And I'll tell you sometimes when I'm praying with you, if you've never received, I'll say, turn off your brain. Let the Spirit, he's in you, let him speak. And uh, just, uh, if, if all that comes out at first is la, 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 let it. It'll turn into a language. Because that's your first step. You know, when uh, when Cooper started speaking, he, may, he and Haven, they're maybe the youngest ones in here, when they started talking, you know, they didn't look at y'all and go, hi, Mom, hi, Dad, what's for supper? You know, they probably said, Mama, Dad, Dad, Baba. I don't know what they said, but something like that. So sometimes when people first learn to yield their tongue, you're not learning to speak in tongues. Oh, let's put that to rest. You can't teach somebody to speak in tongues. Anybody out there having classes to teach people to speak in tongues? Stop it. The Holy Ghost can do the work. The only thing we do is like somebody having a baby. You, sometimes you need a midwife. That's why Peter and John went down there and prayed for those people in Samaria. They needed a midwife. So I'm saying, come on, push, push that baby on out. Come on, sister, yield, push that baby out. Sometimes I'm going to have to say to somebody, come on, yield. I see your tongue trembling. I see your tongue kind of getting heavy. I say, that's the Holy Ghost. And when I say it, I'll say, come on, let him, let him speak. And the help put, uh, I feel like the help put some of those tears oh, to rest. You know, because I've heard that as an argument. Some people say, oh, they're just goading them into, you know, manufacturing something to, like, try to, but, and it's, you know, it's not real. They're just goading them into speaking gibberish. But, you know, I know people, my old wife being one, who, completely on their own in their bedroom floor, just on their knees, you know, prayed for it. And with no one else there, 
boom, they yeah. were able to, they started speaking in tongues. And so I do believe a lot of times it is easier and comes, comes more easily when you have people who know that and are experiencing that frame with you. But 100%, it's something that can happen. I mean, I know ministers who talk about going into the woods and saying, God, I want what you got for me, and then boom, it happens. So, you know, this isn't like it only seems to happen when they're like, go to be like, come on, you do it. It, it is 100% a thing that can happen you know, on your way to work in the car, in your yes. prayer closet, on your knees, or here with the, your brothers and sisters in Christ praying for you. That's right. But it's not just something that, because I've definitely heard people use that as an argument. Yeah. So people try to use that. That's that not the only way it can happen. Yeah, or sleep. I don't know if I experienced that when I was seeking. In the center of sleep. And I was actually in those places you were talking about, you know, seeking sanctification and all that. But one night, one night, and I woke up, or whatever, probably sleep. I don't know if I was dreaming or anything, but they're saying I need to listen. I think I was speaking in tongues too, but I didn't understand, you know. Right? So who knows when you can you do it any time. I was in my prayer closet at Carolina down in college on top of my shoes because I believed that scripture about the prayer closet. I thought it meant really you had to get in your real closet. It's good if you want to, but I thought that's what it really meant. I had to get in my closet. I was in my closet on top of my shoes all cramped in there. I started speaking in tongues. Then when I went back to church, I'd been seeking for two months, you know, and everybody clapping me on the back. Nothing happened. Then in my closet then. And when I went back to church and just went to the altar and here it came out, they're like, she's got it! She's got it! I'm like, yeah, I had it like two, three days ago already. I had it two months ago when God told me. So, anything else? May start just playing a something anointed. Everything's playing anointed. We need to understand this. If you say, why is this so important? It's because when he called me to Walnut and Cove, he told me to focus on him. My theme song at that time was Help Me Lift Jesus, Luther Barnes, 1982. Help me lift Jesus. I didn't come here in 82, but it was that song. But here's the thing. He told me that I was going to have to come to Wanna Cove and preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost because he showed me that nobody else in the downtown area was preaching the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because if they are, I haven't met them yet. Oh, I want to. I think some are, are starting to preach it some. Um, so this is key. This was the main reason he sent me here, people to be filled with the Spirit, because when you're filled with the Spirit, it lifts Jesus. It's all about him. He is the Holy Ghost baptizer. Whew, Jesus. Who else? Ask me anything. I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't pretend to have them all, but he does. And if you ask me or anybody something here we don't know, we're going to seek him and say, show us, God. We need to know. Say it, sister. So, you know, we talk about, you know, like, you know, church, we hear anointing in our life. Okay, but, I mean, from my study, anointing means position. So when I think about, you know, receiving Christ, and I guess I picture, you know, almost like a knight, be knighted or whatever, you're being anointed, positioned for that, for the call of God. And then you need to power over those. So I think sometimes we think, and maybe I'm wrong, however, that anointing is power, but it's positioning and the power. She said anointing is positioning. If you study anointing biblically, it, w it meant that someone had been chosen to do something special and they anointed them to send them forth to do it. Uh, that's why the kings in the Old Testament were anointed. Before they could be king, they had to be anointed, sent forth. In other words, they've been positioned for something to do for God, and you anoint them to send them forth. But I think power and anointing can go hand in hand. You know, they're not necessarily the same thing, but they go hand in hand. And I think you can sense anointing, when you, especially when you flow in the Holy Ghost, but not necessarily other people too since anointing the um the king king saul was living an evil life at one point in the bible but he went into a room where the anointing as we as we say it if that's right or not the power of god was in such evidence saul started prophesying of god and it was truthful you say well he was evil how could that happen anybody can sense the thick power and anointing that God
God has sent him to a place. Can I say real quick? What I was talking to Mom, which we didn't get into it today, when I was reading Acts 2 the other day, God showed me something I'd never seen before and how many times have we read Acts 2. But when I was reading it, all of a sudden I realized that Peter, after he talks about this is that from the prophet Joel, he starts quoting David from Psalm 16. And I'm like, well, I wonder what that means. So I went and started comparing scriptures. And Peter, when he tells the scripture, he says, and my tongue will rejoice. But when I went back to Psalm, it said, and my glory rejoices. And I thought, well, that is so interesting. But it was like, if you study that that word glory, kavod, it's, a, it's like a heaviness of the Lord, the heaviness of the Spirit. So Peter is saying, this is the glory. The tongue was evidence of his glory resting upon him. I've never heard what she was telling me the other night, but it's true. Acts 2 and Psalm 16 line up almost word for word. I didn't even know that. So good. You still might need to do a teaching on that soon. Anybody else? And, and if you've not, if, if you're saved, if you have not committed your life to Jesus Christ, I will not pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You have to have done the first work there. You repented to follow Jesus. Doesn't mean you're perfect. Melinda was talking about this earlier. There are churches that teach that you can't be filled with the Holy Ghost until you're sanctified and you're living right. You'll go up to the altar and be praying for the Holy Ghost, and they'll look right at you and say, if you take that bracelet off, sister, you'll probably be filled with the Spirit. Because you're wearing that adornment that Paul said, don't wear to get your husband. Take it off. You know what? That's baloney. Just as you are, if you have come to Jesus and you've said, I want to follow him, I'm going to say it. You might still be doing stuff you know you're not supposed to do. But you've come to Jesus and said, I'm sorry, I want to stop. Help me stop, Lord. I want to follow you. You can be baptized with the Holy Ghost even then. You don't have to be some sanctified saint to receive. Why? Because you in your own works can't sanctify yourself. You can't try to act all good on I'm gonna I bet I get the Holy Ghost. I thought that. I bet I get the Holy Ghost tonight because I've been living real good. I didn't go out with all my friends when they went out drinking at college the other night. I bet I get it tonight. It's not based on how good you are. It's based on him. He's your righteousness. He's your saint. Oh, I just felt the Holy Ghost. He is your sanctification. Get it out of your head that you've got to be living just right before you could ever receive that gift of the Holy Ghost. Why you got to be saved? Unless you got another question, if you do, I'm willing to answer. I think we just need to pray as we close out and sing. you got to get up and walk around. Like I said, go to the kitchen. There's bottles of water. Go get your bottle of water. Uh, walk around in there. My husband had to get up and walk around. That's okay. You've been sitting a while. But don't stop praying. Before you have to go, I want you to just pray. If you want, if you are saved and you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you let us know. We'll pray for you. I don't push anybody into it. That's your business with God. But I will preach to you that to move in power, you need it. So we're going to pray. If they want to sing, they can sing. If you want me to pray for you or not just me, got many prayer warriors here. You tell us. For healing, too. Anything you need. Oh, God. I've already told people how to be saved. I've already given an altar call. It's out there on mind, even. But let this be the day. Oh, God. See you.
as I said, who teach that until you've spoken in other tongues as being baptized with the Holy Ghost, that you can't go to heaven. When Philip preached the word to Samaria, they received the word. They received Jesus. They received him. If they were going to be doomed to hell until they spoke in other tongues, as the Spirit gave utterance, then why did Philip go on about his way? He would have stopped right then. But, but, but I'm not done. But Philip went on. And then Peter and John came down. They had to travel. It wasn't right there. They had to travel. So according to that belief, then if any of those people at Samaria that had received Jesus, the word into them, had gotten killed in a chariot accident or something, according to the false teaching, they'd have gone to hell right then, even though they'd received the word. But they wouldn't have. I'm going to give you another example. Philip saw a eunuch riding down the road, a foreigner. And the eunuch was trying to study the scriptures of God. And Philip came along beside him and said, you want me to help make those clear? I help, I'm supposed to be talking to somebody else. But uh, make them clear. And the eunuch was like, yeah, yeah, come on. So Philip rode with him a while. And Philip made the scriptures clear to him to the point that the eunuch said, wow, I see that. I see Jesus. I'm paraphrasing but he wanted to be baptized. And Philip said, well, right there's some water. I don't know if it was a river, a lake, whatever. Right there's some water. Let's baptize you right now. So they stopped the chariot, took the eunuch, and baptized him in water immediately, the Bible says. Philip was carried away in the spirit to somewhere else. Yeah, that really can happen. Hadn't happened to me yet, but Philip was carried away in the spirit somewhere else. There's no evidence that the eunuch, after he was baptized in water, was baptized in the Holy Ghost and was in, spoken other tongues. There's no evidence of it. Philip left him right there. You see the point there? The point is, if, if the eunuch was still doomed to hell at that point, and that's not a bad word it's for kids when you use it that way. If he was still doomed to hell at that point, Philip wouldn't have left him. Philip trusted God that I've planted some seeds here. Now God's going to water and somebody else will come along and talk to him about all that. Philip was immediately gone and said, I felt like I had to say that as much, not as much here as here. The final thing that I got to say to somebody is the feast of the Lord. The reason we study him here, seventh, biblically. The reason we study him is they show you your walk in Jesus. I'm not going to teach him right now, obviously. But the four spring ones have already been fulfilled in Christ. The three fall ones we're getting ready to go into are prophetic. They haven't been fulfilled yet. Feast of Trumpets is coming back. Day of Atonement, Judgment Day. Feast of Tabernacles, we dwell with them forever. Those are the fall because they haven't been fulfilled yet. In the spring, if you want to know about the Holy Ghost, and you're going to argue with me, and I'm not going to argue with anybody. You're going to argue with me that, uh, you know, until you experience that speaking in other tongues Pentecost that you're not saved, I'm going to tell you this. There's three feasts in the spring that represent the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That is the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. They're all within one week. They all happen right there together. The Feast of First Fruits tell you right there that's resurrection. Those happen together, the way we preach salvation, death, burial, and resurrection. Guess what the fourth feast is? I know you can guess. It's Pentecost. It's a separate feast. They'd already been brought out of Egypt right there when they started celebrating the death, the burial, and the resurrection with those first three feasts. So Pentecost had not happened yet. Now, we can happen immediately when you get saved. It can be right there. That's the best way. But it can also come later. I won't go into all that because we may teach that some with the fall feast, but for those who are going to argue that until you experience that Pentecostal baptism in the Holy Ghost, you've not had a death, burial, and resurrection, according to the feast of God on his calendar, they've already happened together. Pentecost comes right after that, right there. Jesus in the resurrection to them. 
And then when they heard the word, suddenly the Holy Ghost falls on them. Yeah. So they heard the word and the word came out of them. So I just want us to thank him today for what he did for us. And when we are in that spirit of thanks, <coughs> if you need to leave, you leave. But if you want to stay in presence, come on, we love everybody.
Thank you.